all our panelists are here, Mike, so we can Great. get underway whenever. All right. Um, let me give Professor Ochin just a second to return to her desk. Um, I think everybody's in the audience. Thanks everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, to our panelists, it's good mm -hmm. to see you all. Um, if you've submitted something to us in writing, we have read it. I'd like to, re the best part of our meeting is really the conversation we have after your presentations, but I do like to give everybody um, a five minute um, opening to uh, to hit the high points, but really do please keep them to the high points and extra points if you keep it under five minutes. So our panelists for this afternoon, um, well, let me first say, um, we're gonna have the panel presentation, then we're gonna hear from Jennifer Schaefer from the Board of Parole Hearings, then we'll take some, we'll do some quick administrative updates, hear from our legal director, and we'll discuss um, the issues that we've discussed that we've um, already heard about and we'll hear about in today's panel. That's our agenda for this afternoon. Um, our new panel, our se next second panel of the day, um, is proving innocence once you've already been convicted. Our panelists are uh, Joseph Triglio, Associate Clinical Press Professor and Executive Director of the Loyola's, Loyola's Law School Project for the Innocent. Um, Jasmine Harris, Director of Policy at the Innocence Center. Nisha uh, Shah, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Nisha. Nisha, hi, hi. Nisha. Who's Deputy Director of Litigation at, the, at HCRC, the Habeas Corpus Resource Center. And Thomas Trainer, who's Deputy in Charge of the Con Conviction Integrity Unit the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. All right. Um, Mr. Triglio, I think we're going to start with you. Thank you for joining us to everybody. So your five minutes starts now. Thank you, Mr. Romano. Good to see everybody here. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, today, I will keep my comments brief because I would uh, invite the conversation to follow. Um, but, you know, for the last 15 years or so, I have been at the Federal Defender's Office in the Capitol Habeas Unit and for the past year at the Project for the Innocent, where um, I've been litigating habeas corpus in this state, um, specifically um, under state law. And today I'm going to um, be offering support for two proposals related to a reform of the state law surrounding um, the statute, the penal code that governs post-conviction relief, penal code 1473. Um, and as my written submission explained more fully, that statute lays out several claims by which a person who is wrongfully convicted can seek and obtain habeas relief. Um, it's been amended several times over the over recent years, which has resulted in a hodgepodge of standards, uh, particularly harmless error standards, um, that have given rise to the potential for inconsistent application. And so my first proposal is to harmonize those standards and to allow for one harmless error standard that requires habeas relief so long as there is no longer confidence in the jury's verdict. Um, that is the current standard for false testimony claims, and it's uh, technically a reasonable probability of a different result. Um, that standard uh, should be applied, um, or we're recommending be applied, to the remaining claims in Penal Code 1473 when you have new evidence of innocence um, or a significant dispute regarding forensic evidence, forensic science. Um, the reason for this, and we can discuss this more when we have our conversation, um, is is what I hope is a non-controversial view um, that's that we should not let a conviction stand if we don't have confidence in the verdict. Um, and it's something I think the legislature has been more open to, and I think it'd be a, 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 a just resol a just reform. My second recommendation in the alternative is has to do with the legislature completing its redefinition of actual innocence. Um, well before we knew about so many wrongful convictions, the California Supreme Court had created uh, a standard of actual innocence that would allow someone habeas relief on that basis. That was the most stringent, literally the most stringent standard in the entire country. You had to show that um, the new evidence pointed unerringly to innocence and undermined every single element of the prosecution's came. The case, the hardest standard in the country. Um, in 2017, the legislature did away with that standard for substantive habeas relief for folks who are in custody and said, no, you don't have to meet that stringent standard to have your conviction vacated. Uh, you just need to show that by a preponderance, if there's new evidence of innocence, 
your conviction should be vacated. My proposal is simply to apply that same new standard to folks who are out of custody and to the remaining areas where that prior old standard still exists, which is in Penal Code 1473.6 and 0.7. Um, and the argument there is is it would um, ensure that the legislative intent to lower the bear the standard of what actual innocence means is applied for folks in custody and out of custody. Um, and I'll leave my remarks there, and I'd be happy to have the conversation as we continue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, extra credit for coming under five minutes. Uh, Ms. Harris. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Jasmine Harris. I'm the policy director at the Innocence Center, but I am also the policy advocate for the California Innocence Coalition. Um, our coalition is made up of four innocence organizations here in California, the Northern California Innocence Project, um, Los Angeles Innocence Project, the Innocence Center, and Loyola's Project for the Innocent, where my colleague Joe hails from. Um, our coalition works to craft and pass laws that prevent wrongful convictions from happening in the first place. We hope to craft avenues of relief like we're talking about today and hopefully empower exonerated people upon their release. Um, today, I'm happy to uplift two key recommendations from the memo um, that kind of bookend this habeas process, um, but of course are interconnected with each other. Expanding who has access to post-conviction discovery and establishing a fair standard for overcoming procedural bars in habeas petitions. Um, starting with um, expanding access to discovery, as noted in the memo um, and emphasized in Joe's presentations, um, habeas petitions require the petitioner to present evidence in relation to what was presented at their trial. There's a beautiful chart in the memo outlining um, the scope of each um, standard. And um, when, when I say something like that, for example, when we raise a false evidence claim, we're looking at false evidence that was introduced at trial. When we raise a new evidence claim, we're looking at new evidence that has not been previously presented or heard at trial and so on. To prove that evidence was false or new, um, et cetera, petitioners must have access to their trial discovery to examine that relativity. Um, currently individuals with sentences less than 15 years must wait essentially until an order to show cause is issued after they file their habeas petition to gain access to that discovery. Um, this is problematic, of course, because as we'll talk about next, petitioners really only get one chance to file. There's one bite at the apple. Um, unless they can meet an impossibly high standard, which forces them to file without all the necessary information and often setting them up for failure. When the coalition worked to pass 1054.9, the 15 year standard sentence threshold was a compromise to pass the bill. I think many of us who work in lawmaking know that you don't always get what you want um, when trying to get laws passed, but if it moves the ball forward, you work with it. And essentially that's what builds this patchwork you know, penal codes that we have. And I know that was mentioned in the previous panel as well. Um, but this arbitrary term implies that those with shorter sentences are less likely to be innocent, which is unreasonable. Um, so ensuring all petitioners have access to their discovery ensures all innocent people have the opportunity to prove their innocence. Um, we recommend expanding discovery access to everyone, regardless of their sentence, um, and broadening what is made available, which my colleague Nisha will address um, in her comments. So just to touch on procedural bars, um, that other bookend just briefly, um, currently, and as it's, as it's noted in the memo, petitioners must file timely habeas petitions and they must avoid piecemeal filings. Um, this, as, as mentioned, forces individuals oftentimes to um, file with evidence that they have, even if it's not complete, even if it's incomplete to avoid missing deadlines. Um, many file prematurely and if denied, um, may later find stronger evidence, but face procedural bars for filing again. Um, our recommendation for this issue is to add subsection G to Penal Code 1473, and I included that language um, in my memo, so I won't read through that. Um, but essentially saying that in order to overcome timeliness or successiveness in the habeas petition, the petitioner has to establish that in light of all the evidence in front of the court now, that it more likely than not, that more likely than not the outcome of the case would have been different. 
Um, I'll just close by highlighting that although discovery access and procedural bars address different stages of the habeas process, they are, of course, interconnected. Petitioners need full information from their trial to file a proper habeas petition. If they file prematurely without all the evidence that just to meet the deadlines, they risk being blocked, of course, from filing again when more evidence surfaces um, unless they meet this unreasonably high unerring standard. Um, our proposed recommendations would ensure that all evidence of innocence is considered, not just evidence that meets an unattainable legal standard, um, giving wrongfully convicted individuals a fair chance to be heard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Sh Ms. Shaw? Um, yeah, I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Um, all right, great. Um, again, my name is Nisha Shaw, and I'm the legal director at HCRC, um, the Habeas Corpus Resource Center, where I represent people sentenced to death in California in state and federal habeas corpus proceedings. Um, the hurdles that wrongfully convicted people encounter in seeking and obtaining exoneration is particularly acute in capital cases. The National Academy of Sciences found that the rate of exonerations among death sentences in this nation is far higher than any category of convictions at 12%. Um, but the National Registry of Exonerations lists 288 exonerations in California. Just six of those, or 2%, are capital cases. Um, so something is horribly wrong with our system when we are so far behind the nation at identifying and setting free innocent people who we have condemned to die. And so I join wholeheartedly in my co-panelists' recommendations um, and also just offer a few modest reforms that I think may move our state in the right direction in time. The proposals um, that I have all relate to uh, Penal Code Section 1054.9 or the post-conviction discovery statute that Jasmine um, just described. Um, and first, and I think this is a little bit shocking, I was frankly surprised when I realized it, um, the statute does not require the prosecution or law enforcement agencies to retain their files. Um, there is a statute that exists that requires the state to retain biological material, but there's nothing about maintaining their files. And subdivision F is very clear that there, it, the statute doesn't require retention. Um, in contrast, the statute requires trial defense counsel to retain their files. And this lack of parity is a little bit bizarre and problematic. And I think it's always going to work to the detriment of an innocent person if the prosecution and law enforcement have nothing holding them back from destroying their files. Um, second, Section 1054.9 restricts the scope of post-conviction discovery to information um, which to which the defendant would have been entitled at the time of trial. This language is out of step with the law and with ethical rules. Um, and those things hold that prosecutors have an ongoing Brady obligation even after trial. Um, one category of information that stays hidden for decades because 1054.9 doesn't adequately cover its disclosure is jury selection notes. Um, those things that reflect a prosecutor's motivations for the exercises of peremptory strikes on prospective jurors. And this is an example from Alameda County. In Alameda County, the DA recently disclosed jury selection notes in a number of capital cases. Um, here, the prosecutor wrote down FB um, to note that a prospective juror who he then struck was female and black. And he then um, used peremptory strikes to ensure that um, not a single black woman sat on a uh, man's jury who he then sought and obtained the death penalty against. Uh, what the law currently says is that a defendant has to make a prima facie showing of discrimination in jury selection to get these notes. Um, there's good reason, or I'm sorry, there's actually no good reason to protect that kind of material from disclosure decades later. And there is really good reason to avoid their destruction. Um, Another reason more expansive discovery beyond what was available at trial is necessary is that critical evidence is sometimes generated after trial. Um, again, talking about capital cases, the leading cause of wrongful convi capital convictions in this country is the use of jailhouse informants who often give false testimony in exchange for some sort of reward or promise from the state. 
And typically that reward doesn't come until after the state gets its conviction and death sentence. And so the documentation of it doesn't actually exist during trial. Um, and 1054.9's time of trial definition is entirely insufficient to protect against wrongful convictions. And in fact, kind of seems designed to keep information generated post-trial hidden. Uh, so expanding the definition in subdivision C to include material that prosecutors are ethically obligated to disclose after trial and to explicitly include jury selection notes in combination with a requirement that the state retain its files um, altogether, I think, will help innocent people identify the causes of their wrongful convictions and hopefully provide them with the evidence they need to plead and prove their habeas corpus claims. Thank you. Thank you. That was five minutes right on the nose. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Trainer, Thomas, good to see you again. Good to see you, Mike. Um, uh, thank you for letting me be uh, kind of a, a late addition to this panel. Um, I, I had an opportunity to speak to Joy, and while I didn't prepare uh, any particular briefing notes, I did want to highlight uh, some of the particular challenges that uh, conviction integrity units have uh, which kind of piggybacks off of what Jasmine and Nisha said. Uh, in particular, uh, first talking about one of the things Nisha uh, brought up was the retention of files or uh, evidence, non-biological evidence. Uh, the Conviction Integrity Units, uh, one of the main constraints on our investigations is the uh, loss or destruction of uh, physical evidence in cases. And so, and, and that includes biological evidence. So I think there needs to be, uh, and I would recommend uh, that there be a uniformity among law enforcement agencies, because while some uh, may have particular uh, policies uh, requiring them to uh, retain their files or their evidence for uh, a particular number of years, there are others that have no policy at all. Uh, and that is a, a, a major drawback uh, when it comes to our investigations. The second uh, part that would uh, tie into some of the things that Jasmine was talking about is uh, our ability to gain jurisdiction with the court absent a pending habeas uh, proceeding to conduct certain types of investigation uh, that are pretty critical to uh, the work that we do. Uh, those may include pitches or uh, obtaining subpoena, subpoena documents or witnesses, uh, getting uh, people transferred out of custody uh, and uh, getting counsel appointed to uh, certain people who uh, potentially could be interviewed uh, but require uh, the advice of an attorney prior to that. So um, I, I would rec um, recommend a proposal uh, that would allow for kind of an expanded jurisdiction post-conviction uh, that would allow uh, conviction integrity units to uh, get in front of a judge and uh, get authorization to do a number of the things that would be uh, very critical to uh, the investigation of these cases. And I think I'm under five. Thank you. You're well under five. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everybody. Um, so let me try to uh, frame this up in a, in a couple of different ways. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Triglia, you were talking about um, the standard for establishing innocence putting aside the procedural bars and that we discussed to harmonize that across the board and you you said evidence sufficient to undermine the confidence in the jury's outcome uh, that that's correct and i should be clear uh, mr Mona, that is not just an innocence right this would affect um um claims based on the presentation of false testimony it would affect claims based on um, new evidence of innocence, sure, and then claims based on a significant dispute that has emerged in the petitioner's favor related to uh, forensic science as well. So if you could meet that burden, then your conviction should be vacated. Correct. And why that, which I think is actually a little bit of a, to my mind, and I've litigated under this, some of these statutes, it's a little bit, it's less clear to me than a preponderance standard, although I think in practice it's kind of ends up being the same. And I just wonder for simplicity's sake why we shouldn't just have preponderance 
Sure. Uh, same, well, same goes for reasonable probability. I don't understand why that's different than preponderance. Sure. So, you know, that's the standard was first articulated by the United States Supreme Court uh, in the context of claims involving the withholding of prosecution evidence. So like Brady claims, essentially, and as well as ineffective assistance of counsel. So the Supreme Court identified this reasonable probability standard, right. which the California Supreme Courts have adopted um, that you mentioned, that is um, considered less than a preponderance. And the case law is clear. You do not need to established by a preponderance to get relief under that standard. And so it's, it's, I think about it, and you know, this is not um, uh, case law, but if you're looking at preponderance being 51%, about 30%, right? It's a 30% for reasonable difference. probability. Correct. For reasonable probability. Exactly. It's sufficient to, to undermine confidence, I think is the key language here. Um, not, that's, not necessarily that's showing that's more. Lower. Correct. And this is the this is the uh, what the legislature has already applied to again false testimony claims, um, claims involving intimate partner battery under fourteen seventy three point five, um, and there are four other states that have that have applied the same reasonable probability standard to innocence claims as well. But we're not talking about reasonable probability. We're talking about undermining the, the no no that's the same. I'm glad you asked. That's the same standard. It's the. It, it's a mouthful. Reasonable probability of a different result sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome is the entire standard. Would you say it's the converse of reasonable doubt? It's like creating a reasonable doubt in the in the verdict if you're going to put your scale and your percentages on a scale or, or not necessarily? I would say it's a little harder if you're flipping it. I would say it's a little harder for the petitioner to meet than just having to show any reasonable doubt. I think that I think, uh, Ms. Rummel, that what you're articulating would be the NAPU standard, any likelihood of a different result, which is which is harder for the, well, I'm sorry, which is easier for the petitioner to meet than this reasonable probability. This is a little bit more stringent. And uh, the Strickland versus Washington by the U.S. Supreme Court really talks about that standard um, as, as being difficult to meet and sort of weighing this interest of finality and individual rights. And they settled on a, a more difficult standard in that case. And that's Thanks the for the clarification. Reasonable probability. Can you say the whole thing again? Yeah, it's a mouthful. And I no, no, a reasonable through. probability of a different result sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome. And that seems like two different things. No, the same same thing. <laughs> no, reasonable probability of a different outcome is one thing. Undermining the confidence in the I don't know, it just seems confusing. I, it, I would I would advocate that we strike one of the two of those two things. Sure. I mean, I think the the it's sufficient to undermine count is undermine confidence. That part of it is is definitely more ambiguous and a little bit doesn't provide the same guidance that maybe reasonable probability does. Um, but they are considered uh, analogous and equal um, in terms of how the standards applied. And both are. And there's a fair bit of case law interpreting those standards and helping us understand them already. That's correct. Uh, and I, I believe it should be cited in my proposal. It's Strickland versus Washington, I'd point you to, that has the, I think, the most that clear. Doesn't talk about, um, doesn't, yeah, that's about reasonable probability for sure, but not the other second half. Tom, where do you feel what call on this? Are, I, I want to get this clear in my mind. Are we talking about vacating the conviction at this point, or are we talking about motions for factual innocence? Well, because in in the briefing vacating, notes that I read, I, I vacating vacating conviction, right, Joe? Yes, that is correct. Okay, because I I thought I had read in the uh, briefing notes that it, this was under the heading of quote unquote actual innocence, and, and so yeah. um, to that extent, I I do uh, I I did have a little bit of an issue with it uh, when it comes to the uh, vacating a conviction. Um, you know, while we're continuing to kind of uh, lower the standard, I, I believe the preponderance of the evidence standard uh, in terms of uh, affecting the outcome of the trial, uh, that certainly is already a, a fairly low bar in my mind uh, for petitioners to meet. Um, but I, I, I will I will freely admit that I haven't uh, researched this issue in all of the uh, associated case law as much as uh, Mr. Triglio. So well, I think Mr. Um, Triglio is saying that that is the current standing and his proposal is to lower it. Is that correct? 
that that is the current standard for new evidence. Uh, if you have new evidence of innocence, it is currently a preponderance. Right. So, Mr. Trainer, what I guess I'm asking is, do you think that new evidence establishing a reasonable probability? So, correct me if I'm saying this correctly. Um, the person was wrongfully convicted. I'm shorthanding that there. Is a proper is an appropriate standard for vacating a conviction, uh, or do you just keep keep it at preponderance? I, I I would be in favor of keeping it at preponderance because in in my view and at least in my application, uh, that you know in in looking through the case law interpreting it, that essentially uh, requires a fifty one percent. Proof uh, that one of the twelve jurors could have uh, harbored a reasonable doubt, uh, given this new evidence. In my mind, uh, that uh, that is a sufficiently uh, that that standard is sufficient, uh, and and certainly I, I feel it's a a pretty fair standard for petitioners. Sure, sure. No, I get it. Now, I, one of the objections is maybe maybe uh, tell me if this is where you're going, Tom. Is that we have a lower we apply the lower standard reasonable probability for false evidence, and that's kind of incongruous. That if you get false evidence, then you can come forward more easily than if you just merely have new brand new, new eyewitness. And are you okay? And the idea is let's just make it one standard across the board. So it's we act so courts don't even even have to have be having this conversation that we're currently having. Uh, I certainly am uh, generally in favor of making things easier on judges to understand, um, and so from that perspective, uh, I, I would be in agreement. Uh, but uh, if you're asking me in terms of the new evidence standard, uh, given my experience and uh, given the application that I see in in the work that I've done, uh, I certainly think that's a fair standard. Um, so I, you know, again, um, I'm open to talking to Joe, and and I know we're going to be meeting uh, in in just about a week or so. Uh, so I'm opening, I'm open to listening to uh, to the arguments that he has about that. But uh, uh, as we as we sit here right now, I I do believe that the preponderance standard. For new evidence is a, a fair standard for petitioners. Got it. Professor Rommel, did you have a question? I, oh, I'm still thinking through all of this, which is very interesting, but I, I do think there's a difference in kind between cases where there's false or fabricated evidence and where there is um, new evidence. I, and I, I don't know if that merits a different standard, but I think it's it, there is, there's a, an important difference in those cases. And then the next step of evaluating how that evidence impacted the jury verdict. Maybe Jasmine, I want to get you or or, or um, Nisha, anybody. Or am I just make? Is this just kind of an academic conversation anyway? Like you know, if you have new evidence, reasonable probability, or you know, do people fall in between this gap where a judge says, "I think you're at a reasonable probability, but you're not at preponderance, so therefore I'm going to keep you in prison for the rest of your life." Is that what? Well <laughs> The, the problem the problem is with with identifying that is for two two reasons. Number one, uh, so many petitions uh, are denied summarily, where we have no idea why the judge is kicking them out. Um, and number two, in the appellate courts, they don't even have to state their reasons at all. It can be postcard denials. And so this protects pro se petitioners who don't have counsel. And it protects um, and it ensures judges are applying a uniform standard where we don't have the opportunity to brief the case before it's even denied summarily. Uh, and so this standard would would protect those pro se folks and also um, ensure a standards being fairly applied at the preliminary stage. And Ms. Remmel, you're exactly right. There is a difference there between false testimony and new evidence. I, that's exactly right. But that difference has to do with um, the nature of what went wrong at the trial and is ignoring the the ultimate effect of, of a person who was wrongfully convicted, having a uniform standard would 
um, would put the emphasis and focus on the wrongful conviction rather than the cause and the reason why. Is my volume better now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Apologies. Um, Ms. Harris, I wanted to move to the question about, um, I believe you were bringing up the issue about ex uh, exceptions from untimely and piecemeal litigation. Mm -hmm. And your suggestion is that courts consider successive petitions and untimely conditions. First of all, there is an exception, right? If there's just cause, that gets you over any procedural exception, right? Well, the exception points you back to that incredibly high standard that we've been talking about, that a court can make that analysis and say, okay, I can let you overcome this procedural bar, but whatever you're, whatever you put in this petition has to point unerringly to innocence and completely undermine the prosecution's case. For, to win on the merits or to win on the, or just to get over the procedural bar? Just to get over the procedural bar. The procedural bar points, so there's there's no just cause, isn't there just cause like I, I've been locked up and of course I didn't have access to mitochondrial DNA testing. That that I think will get you over procedural bars, no? I, I think it depends on what was raised before and what you're raising now. So that would that would might be a new evidence claim where you have a whole new claim of new evidence. All right. Um, so your suggestion is that it's an exception to proceed to any procedural bar or timeliness and successive petitions, at least if what, if, and we have the language obviously, cause I tried to run this bill, um, this last year, um, but to, to overcome that specific exception, um, essentially the habeas petitioner must establish that in light of the new evidence now before the court, that it more likely than not would have, would have changed the outcome of the case. So similar to the language you see in new evidence, which you know that was changed in 2017, as Joe highlighted so for us. So that's that's the that's a preponderance standard. Yes. All right. More likely than not, that the new evidence presented would have had a different result, and that is sufficient to overcome timeliness. Right. That seems to make some sense. Um. From the Mr. Trick, I'm I'm just going to keep on going until somebody else from the panel raises it. From the defense bar, I'm curious: Does anybody have concerns about prosecution initiated jurisdiction to, in the scenario that um, Mr. Trainer mentioned? I don't think that Tom, you're suggesting that, and and I don't know why not that we just allow prosecutors to file habeas cases you're suggesting some sort of quasi reopening the case, but not a full habeas petition. Yes, because, because of some of the issues that have already been discussed in terms of the, uh, you know, procedural hurdles and, and uh, deadlines and, and uh, those types of things associated with habeas petitions. Um, and as you all are probably very well aware of uh, these investigations, at least that are done in our county are very uh, lengthy and, and time consuming. And so uh, to have that kind of burden of, of complying with the uh, procedural requirements of habeas petition uh, during the pendency of a, a very potentially lengthy investigation uh, would not really be tenable. Um, so yeah, we're, we're uh, I'm suggesting some kind of quasi uh, jurisdiction, which, you know, quite honestly, I, I've, I've gotten some judges to go along with uh, on on these cases, but I've had a number of other judges who 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 just won't. So uh, if there was something uh, more formalized uh, for that purpose, uh, it certainly uh, would be a boon for for the type of work we do. Does anybody from the defense bar have a concern about? Um if I may, I, I think my, I think it's a, a great idea. It sounds it sounds to me, and Tom, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's potentially a, allowing the prosecution to basically file a 1054.9 motion to get things like pitches material, things that we can do to get a subpoena before a petition is actually filed, allowing the prosecution to do it, which I think is a great idea. Tom, I think where the concern might be is ensuring that doesn't allow 
um, someone who's not in the CIU, another prosecution entity from using the statute to get um, confidential materials related to our clients, um, medical records, things that would be privileged that should be have a little more oversight from um, the courts before that stuff comes into play. Things like trial file from the the uh, from the petitioner um, that may be at issue in a habeas petition if the the person's asserting IAC, but certainly before that proceeding shouldn't just be waived and opened up. But in terms of the material that I think um, Mr. Trainer is focused on and looking for, I think it makes a lot of sense. Who mentioned uh, the post-conviction Brady issue and obligation? Nisha, was that you? Yes. Can you right. outline that a little bit in the state of the law, at least in California? Um, the state of the law, I think, is, um, well, if I can step take a step back from the state of the law, I think the state of play, I guess I will say, before um, in Ray Jenkins, which came down, I think, last year, um, was my at least my personal experience was the attorney general's office took the position in capital cases that they did not have uh, an ongoing brady obligation um and i think probably different district attorney's offices across the state took different positions um i can't speak for every single office but i think that was the kind of the state of play um in Ray Jenkins was a non-capital habeas case that went up to the California Supreme Court uh, in which um, what I remember of the facts off the top of my head is that uh, there was Brady information that was not that the attorney general's office had, um, but did not disclose that they had it during the informal briefing. And the California Supreme Court in Jenkins ruled that they do have an ongoing Brady obligation and an ethical obligation under um, Rule 3.8 of California's ethical rules uh, to disclose Brady material. And um, I would also add that Rule 3.8 has a requirement that is a little lower than Brady. So it's not just exculpatory evidence. Um, I can't off the top of my head tell you the exact language, but it's a little bit lower than the Brady um bar all right so to clarify then so do we have a problem do we so it sounds like we have is problem solved no I don't, I don't think so i i mean my i think the the reason i raised it was because if you look at the language of 1054.9 1054.9 really focuses on what a petitioner would have been entitled to at the time of trial right, right. but then it, what about this what about this case this case says they have an ongoing Brady obligation. Um, that is a basically reliant on good faith kind of situation. Um, and I think if you're filing a 1054.9 motion. I'm, so, I'm sorry, why is it based on good? Is, is it now the, I mean, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be codified. That maybe is, should be the, are you saying basically that Jenkins should be codified? I think, yeah, I think that's, I think we're saying the same thing. Yes, I think it should be codified. I also think that um, the language of 1054.9c is is kind of deceptive, for lack of a better word, for a judge who is looking at um, the statute and saying, oh, well, all I'm required to give you under the statute is what you were entitled to at the time of trial. Right. But Jenkins says under the Sixth Amendment, you have a, or under Brady, Fifth, Fourth, whatever amendment that all falls under. Um you have a constitutional right to post -convic conviction Brady discovery. Is that what you, Brady material? I, 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 sorry to interrupt. I think part of the pro problem is who's deciding whether it's Brady material. If it's left to the prosecutor entirely, they can say, well, I don't think this is material. The defense attorney may have a different view. What 1054.9 says, you have to give it to me anyway. You don't have to decide whether it's going to help me or not. I think that is often the problem with Brady material writ large, but especially post-conviction, where once you sort of have a trial that's happened, the people who won the trial are going to say, of course, this wouldn't have made a difference. Or, it's, you know, you can imagine some bias like that creeping in. So you take all the guesswork out of it if you require disclosure of material um, via statute instead of this sort of determination of materiality that each prosecutor's office has to make that's unreviewable by anyone. That's sort of how I, I think about it. I don't know if that's and consistent. I think the prosecutor's with office may not have... Um 
knowledge of what the defense may be pursuing in terms of new or new evidence. Right. They may have no idea that a certain witness has recanted or any, you know, something else to even make a proper evaluation that information they hold is Brady. I understand. I understand. I mean, it's always up to the prosecution to decide whether or not something's Brady material. So, I mean, I think that we have that problem to begin with. But so you're saying under 1054.9, you have to file a motion under 1054 is an ongoing obligation on behalf of law enforcement. Um, you have to file them. Well, there there is a case in Ray Steele. Um, I think it's 2005 that says that the prosec prosecution is expected to engage in informal discovery um, prior to us no, filing it. I'm not talking about discovery, and I'm trying to take it out of the capital context to because that's the litigation right, is no. always ongoing. I'm just trying to take it in the general case. Does the prosecution have an ongoing obligation to turn over what we'll call exculpatory evidence? In a general case, yes, they do have that obligation. Whether they follow through on that obligation or know what the Brady material is, I think, is a different question. Then they have the obligation under what? Under case law or under 1054.9? For Brady material, I think it's under case law. Um, for material that would have, if it's Brady, that would have been, that the defendant would have been entitled to at the time of trial, 1054.9 also applies. So that's an affirmative obligation. You don't need to file anything. Prosecution needs to turn over any exculpatory evidence. Tommy, is that right? Is that what your understanding is? That's my understanding. Um, oh, I meant yeah, Tom. That's I meant. Go ahead. Do you have me? He's better. Uh, Tom, he, Tom, Tom Trainer is better to answer that than me. All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that, that is my understanding um, of the continuing obligation. I, I think, you know, part of the thing that gets brought up is it's been raised a little bit is, is the challenge of, of, of knowing, you know, what material uh, may or may not be Brady. Uh, certainly if, if something gets brought to our attention that that that's um, you know should be a, a, a easily handled, uh, but it's it's kind of the uh, practical reality of of knowing all of the uh, uh, potential Brady uh, evidence that needs to uh, be turned over. So then I'm confused, Tommy Nasowitz. You're saying the problem is who gets to decide? The prosecution, police, they get all sorts of information all the time post-conviction. Somebody has to make a decision whether it's totally irrelevant or is exculpatory. I, what, were the point, what was the point? And I, I'm hearing now that the state of the law is if somebody thinks it's Brady material, then it needs to be turned over. So what's the issue? Well, you're you're assuming the hard question, which is someone has determined it, it's it's Brady material, and I think the statute okay. says give us everything. You don't have to figure out whether it's, everything it's, that ever comes in with my name on it, I've been convicted. Every every piece. So is that what the is that what the proposal is? So what's that's what I'm confused by. Yeah, I think that's a better question than whether existing law does it, because I because I think we're hearing it it it, it hasn't been. Okay, so is the proposal who in it? I'm sorry, who should I direct this question to? Who, who has the answer to the question, you can raise your hand, of uh, should every piece of evidence that has the name Mike Romano attached to it be turned over to Mike Romano post-conviction? It's, it's materiality or not, nobody gives, nobody even evaluates, we just turn it over to Mike Romano, period. Tom Trainer, you're the first to raise your hand. I, I don't think that's a, a tenable situation. Uh, that's, that sounds reasonable to me too. Yeah. Um, so I guess that I'm confused is what's the idea of appropriate post-conviction? I mean, what, what I would argue is something that it, it evidence that's favorable to the petitioner. That doesn't mean material. Favorability and what's exculpatory is, is different from what's material. Material is outcome determinative. Look at the whole. Okay, so, 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 fa so favorable. And you will concede. That favorable is also in the eye of the beholder, and we'll have some, you know, some 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 police officer or some deputy district attorney might get a piece of evidence and not think it's favorable, and therefore not turn it over, and we never knew it happened, never knew it existed. I mean, we see that all the time, but they they C correct. We're trying to 
address this problem in a way that's realistic to address Tom Trainer's perspective that every piece of evidence that says Mike Romano over, we can't possibly go track down Mike Romano every single time his name comes up. But favorable evidence maybe is a little bit lower than material evidence and therefore avoids some of the good faith errors that might exist in law enforcement and police departments. Is that right? Tom Noswitz, does that address basically what you were saying about who gets to decide? I, yeah, I think that would that would help. And the other thing is the a request under 1054.9, you have to either have filed a habeas petition or be preparing to make one. So so it's a it's like a you know a, a request you make to law enforcement at you know so you do have to so this times. isn't a, this is not an affirmative no and, and that's the other so this idea that there's sort of gonna be an ongoing disclosure for everything i don't i don't think that that's really relevant it's well, like hold you on have to... hold on i don't i don't necessarily agree with that so i believe that the law enforcement police prosecutors should have an affirmative duty to turn over favorable evidence in, in Mr. Triglio's, regardless of any pending motion, any pending habeas, any pending anything. Mm -hmm. Cur under current law, what is the rule if you have nothing pending? You're not at capital. You are just convicted of, they have, it, do they have a Brady obligation? That's what we're hearing, yes, but I... But then we have Mr. Triglio, is there is there a about. Brady obligation for your ordinary? I've been convicted of a hundred years and I'm sitting in prison. And I if... after the direct appeal is over, that's less yeah. clear. I believe Jenkins has an ethical. There's an ethical obligation on the attorney general on the state to to turn over that evidence. And my understanding of Jenkins, if and only if the petitioner is alleging a Brady claim, to put the state on notice. Oh, okay. I, and what you're so, talking yeah, about is okay, a little different. Okay. Yeah, no. I, here, I'm, this is a new proposal. Obligation to turn over favorable evidence, period. 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 At any time. That does not currently exist, to my understanding. Mr. Trainer, do you see that that is a problematic, or is that right? No. Well, <laughs> I mean, I know uh, favorable is in the eye of the beholder, but we have to draw the line somewhere. Yeah. Uh, do do I agree with it conceptually? Uh, yeah. I would say that I I, I do. Uh, do I do I think that there could be uh, uh, unintended consequences or outcomes? Uh, I, I think there probably could be uh, as well. So, you know, I I think it would present. Um, significant challenges uh, for law enforcement and district attorney's offices, but um, but it, it certainly uh, on a, uh, just on an intellectual level, it, it, uh, it, it does make sense to me. Okay. Do, Yes. Maybe a suggestion for a way to, I think, pull together everything that we've just been talking about, at least for consideration, which would be that um, all evidence is turned over pursuant to a uh, petitioner's request under 1054.9, which requires the law enforcement to, you know, gather everything. They don't make any determinations about what's what they give everything to the person who's requesting it, which is going to be a lot of the people who are, you know, have issues with, or difficulty with the conviction. And then, um, Maybe we define favorable, you know, if one of the primary investigating officers is later found to be this, or maybe, you know, uh, uh, a witness recants, and maybe we we define favorable so that there's less ambiguity and the prosecution team has more guidance and we're getting the information that really is going to be important to cases, even where the person with the conviction is not seeking a different result, affirmatively seeking a different result. I don't my my where i'm sticking point and maybe it's because it's my you know i'm holding on to my piece of the elephant where the, the cases that i work on um is people who do not have attorneys do not understand habeas law do not even understand so i think this idea that you have to file a 1054 motion or a habeas case if there's they i and I'm, i i feel I'm, like that's I'm exactly still the, the problem of of 
material versus favorable and i get that and i'm understanding Chairperson Romano, i feel like that's the big elephant in the room here is that all these things we're talking about and can barely you know get to the agreement in the understanding of how the laws and the case law um, interprets it is we the people we're talking about have no access to investigators to attorneys to motions right. some of them don't mean in right english you know like what what the it, what a bigger issue is is getting the right people the assistance they need to move these cases forward that's a bigger issue but that feels like that is the piece where most people would get the relief I mean, we have these four innocence projects in california that do excellent work but people wait years or decades to even get eyes on their cases and they can't take all the cases that even are you know and and um the conviction integrity units don't have access to the people in prison who who are really you know have stalled you know maintain their innocence for decades so i i know i'm preaching to the choir here a little bit but we can you know and it's good to refine these rules and get consensus and and and, and make helpful rules but until we have a meaningful way to people for people to seek relief under these rules um i'm not sure we're quite where we want to end up my my feeling is that you do, we do not want to end up in this place where you have to file something in order to get brady in order to get favorable material I think you'll also more likely to get an attorney if you have I think that's what I think we're agreeing then if you file something you get everything and there's an affirmative duty to disclose favorable evidence but we define the favorable evidence so well, what it's if you not don't a file wild search but right then some... this prosecution still has a, a duty to disclose favorable evidence as as defined by the statute so there is guidance so it's just not a needle in a haystack search through every case where someone has a conviction I'm so sorry, just to make sure I understand, because if you do not file anything, you've never filed anything, you're sitting in prison, you don't know anything, anything, you think that prosecution should have the duty to disclose favorable evidence? Narrowly defined by us. I mean, I, they already yes. do that when, when there's oh, cops, you know, like, yeah. Hold define, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What if you, I'm trying to get the distinction between, you keep on saying, if you file under 1054, then they disclose more? They just give you everything that's in the file and you just, I mean, then you figure out what's favorable or not or Brady, but you can't, that, that shouldn't be limited. That should be pre and post trial information. Okay. Just to make sure I understand the, the, the without filing anything, favorable evidence, which we will define must be disclosed at any time period in any case. If upon filing of a 1054.9 motion, then the whole file gets turned over. Plus any post-conviction information that's been collected by the agency. I, I think this, I, and I'm not trying to take over the proposal. I'm, I'm just trying to find a middle ground on the one particular issue that we seem to be getting stuck on. Ms. Shaw? I just wanted to, I don't know if this will help, but just to try to give an example of a type of case where this might be um, this might play out. So if if someone is sitting in prison, no counsel, uh, jailhouse informant testifies in their case and subsequently gets a reward in their own case um, in exchange for that testimony. Uh, perhaps the prosecution will turn that information over and send that to the person who's incarcerated. The person gets counsel. Their counsel realizes well, the use of jailhouse informants in this county was rampant, and this informant might have testified in other cases, might have gotten rewards in other cases, might have um, perjured himself in other cases, and would make a broad 1054.9 request requesting, or motion, requesting additional materials and would identify all these other sorts of things that would help prove the claim. And so I think what one might get sitting in prison that the DA or law enforcement identifies is going to just categorically look different than what one might get if you file a 1054.9 motion, because there is just going to be so much more of an understanding of um, all of the potential documents sure. that might be out there. That seems to make sense. 
I have a, a quick question about um, something that we haven't discussed today, which is the Racial Justice Act. And I'm wondering to what extent does the conversation that we're having about Brady disclosure, about access to files, and so on. I know we're focused on wrongful convictions, but as far as I'm concerned, if you were convicted as a result of racist testimony or, or practices, then you're wrongfully convicted. And so I'm wondering to what extent um, your recommendations might also apply to habeas petitions that are filed pursuant to the Racial Justice Act. I mean, I'm going to take a swig in answering that is I think that it's not just the Racial Justice Act, but we're talking about favorable evidence, period. Brady itself actually wasn't about exculpatory evidence of innocence, right? Brady itself is a sentencing case. Um, so I think, you know, favorable evidence to the defendant is anything that's favorable that should, you know, give a colorable claim for habeas, you know, relief. Whether it's Racial Justice Act, ineffective assistance to the counsel, new evidence of mental illness, new evidence, you know. Right. So what I'm thinking of is, say, there's a statutory uh, a claim that's being brought under the Racial Justice Act that's about uh, statistical disparity um, that the obviously wouldn't have been relevant before and certainly that the, the person who's incarcerated wouldn't have access to. And it may apply to an entire class of individuals from a particular county. Um, would that kind of evidence, would the prosecutor, because it is favorable, uh, would the prosecutor be under an obligation to uh, alert uh, individuals who are currently serving time for that kind of an offense uh, of the existence of that evidence? I don't again, think my, go ahead. Oh, I was I just was going to say, I don't think there's a current statutory duty um, that would require that. But I think that's a great idea, I think. Um, what we've seen in racial justice act discovery or litigation is um, very much case by case, right? So there may be a pattern in um, a particular county. I'm representing one individual and requesting the data for that one case. And Joe is representing someone convicted of the same offense and ha have, has the same sentence and is doing almost the exact same litigation. Um, and there is a lot of um, just the way the statute is written, it is kind of individual relief based. And so that is um, the current state of things. And I think something like an additional, an obligation on the prosecution to disclose would alleviate some of those problems of duplication of efforts. And also if a court finds, you know, an uh, an A3 violation under um, the Racial Justice Act, every person who's charged in that way should know. Um, but I don't I don't think that's at all, you know, other than attorneys talking to each other, people talking to each other, there's no real way that I'm aware of. My only reservation would be to specify what um, forms of relief may be um, favorable. Maybe we say, you know, including evidence of actual innocence, evidence of violation of the Racial Justice Act, and comma, and anything else. I wouldn't um, want to presume what we know down the line is or other forms of relief. But yes, I mean, I think that, and the same goes, I assume, Ms. Harris, for the exceptions for um, procedural bars. That you're talking about any evidence that's sufficient to change the outcome regardless of whether or not it is evidence of actual innocence or evidence of racial disparity or evidence of racial animus on behind yes correct yeah, agreed yeah uh, i have a question um are, are we saying then that the prosecution or the district attorney's offices would have an affirmative affirmative duty to turn over just statistical disparity information to uh, to anyone just as a, a continuing obligation because it's it, it's deemed favorable or or are we saying that's of a class of material that if a 1054.9 was filed uh, they they would be entitled to well, 
I can just, I might, you might want to answer this because you're more conversant in, in this area, but this, from my thinking about the Racial Justice Act, say, for example, Nisha's lit, litigating her claim of statistical disparity or racial animus, but here we'll, we'll focus on statistical disparity, um, and she succeeds, right? In that case, there's been a finding that there is a racially significant statistical disparity, which is now favorable evidence. I, although I think prosecutors should be encouraged to publish racial data and the state attorney general should have an obligation to collect all of that data and make it available to the public in terms of an affirmative Brady obligation because data of racial disparity is in itself favorable and unless it's clear that there it's a significant it's it's statistically st significant enough to be a violation of the racial justice act and there isn't a race neutral explanation for why it's there there's a whole process beyond just the existence of the racial disparity but let's say Nisha succeeds right Tom and you're litigating a similar case the prosecutor should make you aware that in your class of cases a judge has found a racially uh, statistically significant racial disparity Thank you. Yeah, I think about it. I think that, I mean, that I think if there's a judicial finding of racial bias, I think that's, I think that's pretty obviously favorable, should be disclosed, as with um, other powerful evidence of, of, an avenue for relief, whether it's innocence or otherwise. Mr. Trainer. Sorry, um, I, I hate to keep coming back to, you know, these kind of practical uh, discussions, um, but, you know, the suggestion uh, made about, uh, you know, the Attorney General's office compiling or gathering and compiling and publishing uh, those sorts of, uh, the, that type of data or any particular findings, uh, certainly seems uh, a little bit more uh, likely for success uh, in terms of uh, disseminating that. But if, if we're talking about, you know, if, if there's a particular finding, uh, as, as was just discussed, you know, going back and, and determining all of those who may have been, who, who it may be favorable to, um, and, and providing that absent some sort of uh, request, uh, practically speaking, I, I just don't see how, uh, I mean, you know, Los Angeles County would have a difficult time, but I, I'm, I'm thinking of even, you know, the smaller counties uh, who don't have uh, the same level of resources. I just don't see how, how that obligation could be adequately fulfilled. I get that. And, you know, let's, I think we all should be cautious here that we're not making the rules of the law. Um, we're just making a recommendation to the legislature and, um, you know, expect concerns, especially about um, practical finance, financial costs of complying with these rules, I think are very well vetted in the legislature. But I think that what we're saying here, and we need to some refinement, of course, and a, a Professor Ochin, tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, is that um, we believe that there should be um, an affirmative duty on behalf of prosecutors to disclose favorable evidence to incarcerated people absent a request. And that favorable evidence is not just evidence of um, wrongful, of actual innocence, although that certainly includes that. But it also includes, and this is the, the difficult part, um, substantiate some somehow substantiated evidence of a violation of the Racial Justice Act. Something to, to that effect. Whether it's statistical evidence or we find that there's a, a racist judge. Um, and then, and the recommendation or the proposal would be that it would just be for incarcerated people or for convicted people. I would, I would, everybody should get it eventually. The perfect world, yes. 
the most important people to, who should get it should be the people who are currently behind bars Ill illegally. Um, I don't, you know, yes, I think if there's information of a racist judge, everybody who is before that judge should know about it, period. Now, I realize that that can be very difficult, but I think everybody should be notified. And sometimes we have to do hard things. Yeah. In, this, in the interest of justice. And it's the law. <laughs> The racial justice is the law that people should not be incarcerated because they sat in front of a racist judge who acted racist, racial, you have, you know, racial bias against them. If the prosecution is sitting on that evidence, they should tell everybody about it. And listen, <laughs> will people get missed? Of course, but there should be a good faith effort to try to reach everybody. I don't think that that's too much to ask. Yeah. Could that proposal or as part of that proposal be that, you know, um, initiating an obligation on behalf of the attorney's ge attorney general's office to collect uh, these types of substantiated claims or data and uh, maintain that uh, in a in an in an accessible way uh, where you know that 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 may relieve some of the uh, not the obligation on the on behalf of the uh, district attorney's office, but it may facilitate the uh, better transmission of that information to all the people who should have it. I can think about that. I, 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 honest, the, the honest, I think the, the honest answer is is that this level of detail in legislation is not something that we normally get into as far as the committee is concerned. I mean, we're we're close to the cusp of our level of detail, but I think the broad, I think we're, have, at least Professor Ochin and I have reached a consensus um, on some broad strokes. And those witnesses, I in a way I thank you for, have, um, um, especially Joe, I understand that you're on vacation, so thank you for joining us, um, is, uh, have, have highlighted some of the, I think, unintentional errors in in ways to correct gaps, confusion in the penal code, um, particularly around people who have been wrongfully convicted, and ways that we can streamline and make more efficient the habeas, especially the statutes around habeas, um, that allow people who are behind bars illegally because they're factually innocent or otherwise um, can make those claims. Um, so I really appreciate panels, panelists for, for bringing it up and perhaps we've gone too down, far down a rabbit hole on one particular issue, although I think it's important and near and dear to my heart. Um, are there other questions from people on the committee? One thing we, there we didn't talk about was the jury note issue. I don't know if that was sort of spoke for itself so strongly, but I just wanted to flag that for you, Mike. So, so, so let me make sure I understand the jury note issue. That's a, just a preservation of evidence question, Ms. Shaw. I think it's twofold. I think it's a preservation of evidence question and a um, question of 1054.9C, which is, um, again, the material to which someone would have been entitled to at the time of trial. Uh, sometimes those notes are protected as work product and and um, it presents a similar problem to that which Joe correctly described about the Jenkins case, which is essentially you have to show prima facie evidence of discrimination in jury selection to get the notes, right? Um, and, and is the notes the only thing that you're concerned about preservation for? Or are you saying that we should preserve evidence? Of I'm generally saying preservation across the board of all prosecution and law enforcement files for anyone for the length of their incarceration, that would, that would create parity between the defense council obligation and the state. Um, but I think the reason I've highlighted the notes issue is because recently in Alameda County, it's come to light that a number of notes in capital cases were destroyed on the heels of it coming to light that uh, yeah. there were discriminatory jury selection practices. And I think that just highlights the problem, essentially. Mr. Okay. Trainer, I know that you're on this Sorry, Professor Ochin. 
I just wanted to also ask Nisha, is there a problem with who retains those records? My understanding is there have been issues with um, local district attorney's offices, you know, for example, saying, you know, we, we don't, not only do we not have things like notes, we don't have the file at all. Um, and then defense attorneys needing to go to the state attorney general's office to get the appellate record if there was one. Um, is that a challenge that you come across? And um, how would you, and if so, how would you propose to rectify that issue? Universal um, record maintenance or, you know, what would you suggest? I think I would suggest um, universal record maintenance and a change specifically in 1054.9. I think it was F, um, the su subdivision that I highlighted. Um, I personally, so capital cases are a little bit different in that um, typically those records are retained by district attorney's offices. So Joe or Jasmine may actually have a better um, sense of, of whether folks have to go to i've i've heard of um non-capital people having to go to the attorney general's office to get transcripts but i haven't personally experienced it um so i'll throw it to them if they have that that is correct sometimes we do have to go to the attorney general sometimes it's not even transcribed sometimes voir dire is not even transcribed for us so we have to actually go to the court reporter to and pay uh quite a hefty sum to get that transcribed in our non-capital cases so we're talking about those are, the tran those are transcripts. Those are separate from evidence and and prosecution notes. But the proposal yeah. is, transcripts are not current. They're currently kept by the court of appeal. They actually are. They're the repository usually. Again, Joe's correct that they're not always transcribed. But if there's a transcript, the courts of appeal generally have them. I don't know what the rules are, but they should definitely hold on to them for the term of the incarceration. I think that that should be um, at least. Um, and is the proposal also that prosecution notes also be retained by, and this would, the case would be by the prosecution for the length of incarceration? I mean, Mr. I would argue the entire file should be should be preserved for I would for the length of the prosecution of the process. The entire file meaning what are you talking? The, the prosecution's the, entire file, which would include that prosecutor's work product as well as yes, the discovery turned over by the by the law enforcement. Correct. Right. Different from transcripts. Correct. Yeah. Mr. Trainer, I hate to put you on the spot to speak for all law enforcement for prosecutors in the state of California. However, does that seem like reasonable to you or not? Uh, certainly. I think as long as it's communicated to everybody and everybody knows what the rules are, um, yeah, I mean, uh, now, again, whether, whether uh, uh, it's a perfect scenario every time. I, I can't say, but I certainly think it's reasonable to expect people to maintain the entire file, including notes, um, from whatever point they're told they need to uh, moving forward. All right. I have, a, have another quick question. I, and sure. and um, Professor Romano, you can, you can tell me where I'm taking us off on uh, a tangent and we'll get to this another time. This, I'm just putting you on notice that this may be a tangent question. Um, if, let's say there's a law change, right? Like felony murder, for example, uh, or an accomplice uh, situation um, that would allow for significant relief for people who are currently inside. But so, and, and I, and I don't know if these are good examples, but I do know that there are certain cases where people don't know exactly what theory the jury adopted to convict them um, and um, may therefore not know if they're eligible for a particular kind of relief. Um, how do those folks find out, uh, hey, this legislation might apply to me? Now, this may be totally different than the conversation we're having and may have nothing to do with the prosecutor's obligation uh, to notify about, this is not evidence, obviously this is a change in law, but I just did, I did wanna flag that because it did occur to me that this is a part of the category um, yeah. issues that we're talking about. So if, if that's a, a different discussion, that's fine. I did, I did wanna flag it. I, I think it's an excellent question. It's something that I deal with every day. Um, in particular, AB 600, which recently got passed upon our recommendation, gives an avenue for relief for almost everybody who's incarcerated, and almost nobody knows about it. Um, so I think we should table it 
but I think that we should think about it. And I think perhaps we put the obligation on public defenders because they are actually the last attorneys of record of these people and the laws have changed in a way that might benefit their clients. And they probably, I think they may have, they, they have some ethical obligation to say like, hey, the laws have changed, you should know about it and it might be helpful to you. But I don't think it, it goes into this conversation that we've been having. So I, I wanna mull on that, but I do think that that's, that's where I would sort of head in our direction. Senator Skip. Um, I'll briefly add, um, Professor Ocean, they, um, this is a something that's debated each time we do these updates to um, statute. And so uh, we've by and large not been able to fund, uh, you know, trying to, to make that information available. So what happens is very much we rely on entities up and down the state that just do this work in effect, either nonprofits or pro bono. We were able to fund the, to provide additional funding to the um, public defenders for the last two years without per se specifying that they include this in their uh, uh, use of the funding. But we did in the trailer bill that appropriated the funding reference that there have been new statute changes that uh, may put additional workload on them. So there was kind of a hint that you could use it for this purpose, but that was a limited time funding. And uh, depending on my guess is it wouldn't be renewed next year, depending on what the states, uh, we had to fight to get it, uh, to keep it for this, the year that we just experienced. Um, but anyway, uh, some statute changes like the felony murder change that I authored um, there were some organizations that secured funding explicitly to go into the prisons up and down the state and orient uh, folks inside to that change. But there's, I'm, I'm only aware of that one being yeah, yeah. that level of concerted effort. So first of all, I'll say that, you know, somebody who does this work, it is very hard to do. It's something that needs to be done. And I, Professor Ochin, I think that we should find a way to um alert folks in a more systemic way we shouldn't be relying on philanthropy to do it which is basically what senator skinner was saying there has been the office of state public defender has received some money and has done a good job and i've worked with them over the past year or so to spread the word about some of these law changes but they're complicated um and it's difficult to to reach everybody so i, I think it's something that we that we as a committee should maybe think about um period and okay, this has all been an excellent conversation. Um, I wanna keep us moving along. We've gone over a little bit of this conversation in part because it scratched a particular itch that I like, which is habeas, state habeas litigation. So thank you all. And and, and you know, and, and thank you all for the work that you, you do. Um, I really appreciate it, appreciate your time. Thank you for coming. Um, please keep in touch with us if there are suggestions or new developments in law or cases that we should be aware of, and we'll be back in touch with you for the same. So thank you to all our panelists for joining us. Thank you. Have a good thank weekend. You. Thank you. Um, all right. We're going to move on to uh, another uh, area, I think, of profound injustice, but not um, actual um, innocence or wrongful wrongful conviction, but let's call it unfair or unnecessary incarceration. We're going to hear from Jennifer Schaefer, who is the um, executive office of the Board of Parole Hearings. She will describe the current impact of ongoing litigation that has prevented the release from prison of people that the board has already found suitable for release. We'll hear from Ms. Schaefer for a few minutes and then have Q&A for the committee. Ms. Schaefer, thanks for joining us. Please take it away. Where you go? She was here and she just dropped just, off, Mike. Let me see. She's been here for like 15 <laughs> minutes and she came right on time. She saw, she saw Professor Romo. <laughs> yeah. All right, she's back. Can Jennifer, you hear me? Okay. We missed you. Did, did, was it something I said? 
<laughs> you know what? I keep getting these things telling me I'm being changed from one thing to another and I'm being logged out and logged back on. But I think I'm here now. If All right. Thank you. you. In the case you missed it, thank you so much for joining us. This is a real conundrum that um, I think many of us are aware of. We'd appreciate some. Can you just set the stage for us and let us know what's going on from your perspective? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. This is a really important issue to us, and uh, we just appreciate your attention and um, willingness to hear. This case um, I'm speaking of is the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation versus the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And at the heart of the issue in the litigation is that a superior court has held that Proposition 57 did not give uh, the authority to the Secretary of, of the Department of Corrections, did not give to the Secretary the authority to promulgate regulations that governed credit earning for people serving life with the possibility of parole. That's sort of it in a nutshell. This litigation has been going on for two years, over two years so far. In June, after a lot of back and forth in litigation, the court and the court of appeal, because we have a, we have appealed the underlying order, the the courts came to sort of a, a finality of sorts while the appeal is pending that basically stayed two portions of the order, but not the third. And so basically what it says is that we can continue applying Prop 57 credits to people serving life with the possibility of parole. We can continue scheduling parole hearings based on um, those parole eligible dates with the Prop 57 credits applied. But if somebody is granted parole, they cannot be released if that credit, credit earning, having been applied to their release date, um, move their release date up such that um, absent those credits, they would not be eligible for release. And so it's a lot, sorry about that. Um, practically speaking, what we are doing is every month, um, we are looking at everyone who receives a grant of parole we're looking at what parole eligible date or dates they have. So a person can have a minimum eligible parole date. That's if that's the basic one based on the um, sentence imposed by the court. So sentenced to 25 to life, um, their minimum eligible parole date would be set at 25 years, less any credits that have been applied. They also might have a youth parole eligible date, which might make them eligible for parole after 20 or 25 years if they're indeterminately sentenced. And, or they may have a nonviolent parole eligible date that makes them eligible um, for a parole hearing after they've served the full term of the primary underlying offense. If they're a third striker or they might have an um, elderly parole eligible date that makes them eligible for parole after serving um, 50, um, excuse me, 20 or 25 years and having attained the age of um, 50 or 60, depending on the law that applies to them. So we look at all those parole eligible dates, we compare them all, we determine which one is controlling if it's their minimum eligible parole date, then case record services with Department of Corrections will manually recalculate their minimum eligible parole date to remove any Prop 57 credits that have been applied. We will then look to see which date now is earliest and they will be released based on whatever date is earliest. Um, all of that said, we grant parole to roughly 100 people a month. That's a pretty rough estimate. It's a little over 100 a month. It's uh, 1,400 a year on average. And so uh, thus far, we're only a couple of months in, um, the statistics have held rather uh, consistent. We think that the litigation is ultimately going to result in about 20 people a month 
or 240 people a year not being released after a grant of parole becomes final because they've earned so much credit in Prop 57 credits and they don't have an earlier parole eligible date. Some of those folks, when their minimum eligible parole date is recalculated, it is pushing their release date out anywhere from a couple of months to many years. And it's a very, um, it's just a very difficult process for everyone. And it's having a significant impact on the incarcerated population, especially those who are granted parole and think that they may be going home soon. And they've gone through a very arduous process. Uh, I think it's also, it, it's not lost on us the fact that Prop 57 credits have been in effect for seven years, since 2017. So the people who have the most to lose are the people who have actually engaged in the most rehabilitation in the last seven years. So um, it's, it's a really difficult conundrum for us and it's having a very significant impact on very rehabilitated people. And also I know I've testified before you before, but I just wanna remind people of just how successful the parole hearing process has been we have released over 11,000 people serving life with the possibility of parole. And every year the recidivism reports come back and they have remained consistent. Less than from two to 4% go on to commit any new misdemeanor or felony after they've been released from a grant of parole by the board. And less than 1% go on to commit any new felony involving harm to another. So we're talking about people being incarcerated longer, who are rehabilitated, who in many cases are going back into the community and actually um, helping um, at-risk people in the community. So it's a really disruptive thing. I'm, I, I wanna be clear, it has a very significant impact on the people whose dates are being recalculated. Um, however, you know, 80% of people, it is not impacting. So we're talking roughly 20% of people who are granted parole fall into this category where their minimum eligible parole dates are being recalculated. I hope, I want to stop for a moment. That was a lot. Um, does anybody have any questions just about the foundation? No, so so thanks a lot. This is super, super helpful. And this is something that I've been keeping my eye on for a while. Um, these let's start with the idea where you ended which is that the most that these this affects the most um um uh, the least risky people to release from prison the people who are arguably most deserving who have engaged in extensive programming especially in the past seven years not the least of which in my opinion i disagree with the superior court that the voters of california overwhelmingly approved putting in the constitution the right of C the department of corrections to set credits period right and the court ruled, well, it didn't explicitly call out the right to, to change credits for people who are serving indeterminate sentences. And therefore, because they didn't specifically say and were men giving CDCR right to do credits for indeterminate sentencing, and then we're going to revert to the old rule. Um, Prop 57 is pretty clear. It says give, give CDCR the right period and does not specify one way or another. It just gives it very broad authority to do credits. Um, I guess my question is, um, well, I have a number. Unfortunately, this is not a, 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 and Tom, feel free to jump in here, but Jennifer, is this as much as an easy fix to 1346, which is the statute that says that indeterminately sentenced people, sentences should not be reduced? Can we just merely say that, amend that with one sentence saying, and it would it, that um, credits may be reduced according to rules set by the CDCR under Prop 57 or whatever the constitutional provision is. So there are a lot of attorneys and a lot of policy people that I think have far greater knowledge about the history of credit earning as they're applied to, as they've been applied historically to people serving life without the possibility or with the possibility of parole. What I do know is that it's incredibly complicated. 
Um, we've had many, many years of case law and propositions and statutory changes such that prior to Prop 57, depending on when somebody had committed their, their crime and what they, what they were actually convicted of, um, credit earning varied greatly. And so I, I don't know if it's that simple of a fix. If you read the pleadings in the CJLF versus CDCR um, I, litigation, I think you will find that there's some very interesting questions about who has the legal authority um, and separation of power issues and what does it mean to amend the constitution um, and give the secretary uh, the ability to propagate. Right. Some people would say are in direct conflict with stat with the penal code. Others would say they're just in conflict with case law interpreting the penal code. So I, I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows a what the what a fix would be to this. And I would also I just want to be really clear. I mean, the board is very much a neutral body in this, and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that there are many victims who, you know, heard sentences were at sentencing being rendered, who thought people were gonna be spending a lot more time in prison and we have been surprised by parole hearings and the fact that they are occurring much earlier than they had anticipated. So I just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna disregard um, the trauma that we see daily in our parole hearings for victims and the survivors and their family members who are also um, significantly impacted by this. But back to your original question, um, I think there is some merit to the idea that a statutory change um, could have a significant impact. Um, we think for what, for what it's worth, it's likely to take about two years for this litigation to be ultimately resolved. And so we're looking at upwards of 400 to 500 people whose dates are going to be recalculated and pushed out. And that's that's a lot of folks over the next two years. Um, I do wanna reiterate some of those folks, their dates are being pushed out you know, a few months. Um, yeah. Others they're being pushed out by seven, eight years or more. Yeah. Tom, can you lay out a little bit about why a simple fix is not possible? Well, I think I, I, I mean Jennifer said it exactly the way I'm thinking about it, which is the court's opinion referenced Penal Code Section 3046, which you did too, Mike. Right. The arguments from the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation included more statutes saying you also can't do this because of these other statutes that. Um, uh, say credits don't apply to sentences for certain offenses. The court didn't address those. So, um, you know, we're still very much researching and, and talking to people, <laughs> like Jennifer said, um, I think trying to figure out, ideally would create kind of a menu of options from a very sort of one sentence fix along the lines, that I think you're suggesting Mike too, do you need to sort of go everywhere credits could possibly be mentioned and, and try to address it? Uh, and that's even just, crediting on its face that the legal arguments from CJLF are correct, which I don't even necessarily want to get into at this point. Um, but I think there's something that could be done legislatively, whether it's a total fix or not, I think is the is the question. How many people would it reach, I think is the open question. And, and hopefully we can come up with something that would reach everyone. I'd be strongly in favor of, um, if possible, a one sentence fix is passed by two thirds that I get that mirrored precisely the language in Prop 57, but maybe put it in statute. Right. And that hopefully that that would not be too heavy a lift by the legislature because it's identical language to Prop 57. And that, well, that, that would sufficiently do the trick. Unfortunately, Senator Skinner isn't here. I don't know if other people have thoughts about how we should proceed, proceed as a committee, but that would be my suggestion. Unless it's impossible. I, I think it's a little more complicated than that, but I would be in support of the simplest fix that we could 
recommend that would address the issue. And basically, because as Tom said, the, 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 the decision by the Sacramento Superior Court is difficult to understand. All right, well, um, I think for today's purposes, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, I think your point is well taken about the victims who are unaware of the cre credits are extraordinarily complicated for everybody involved. Um, victims, defendants, judges, attorneys, the board, I feel like there's so few people who you know, truly understand it, but thank you. And this does seem to be, in my mind, go very much against the will of the voters and the state constitution. So I think it's something that we should address particularly if it's complicated, I think that that is, you know, lands in our area of expertise and trying to sort out the penal code solution. Um, and um, I think that we should sort of take it on by, by that, I mean, staff take on trying to find the best possible fix to address this, to realign um, credits in, in line with the Prop Prop 57 rules that were enacted in 2016, and I guess implemented in 2017. Is that what you're saying, Ms. Schaefer? They were. Yes, they were implemented in 2017. So we've seen just over seven years worth of right. credit earning applied. But they were enacted in 2016 or in November. 16th. Correct. the The proposition was passed in 2016. It took until about July, I believe, of 2017 to get the um, regulations enacted. Right. Well, yeah, you that's know, actually that's like that's lightning speed. That's by, pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, truly. And I, you know, and, and in learning of getting into this issue, I've learned about the just the tremendous amount of work that went on behind the scenes to get those things done so quickly as well. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, tens of thousands of comments, public comments that were received that to be replied to. So it was not like something done in the middle of the night, which I think is part of the suggestion in the litigation. I was a uh, commenter. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and on that same note, you know, we're focusing on what the uh, Superior Court decided sort of against CDCR in this case, but the court also rejected many arguments that basically said CDCR can't set credits at all for anyone. Um, so the, the decision also largely affirmed what CDCR has been doing. It just is for the folks who have these life sentences that you can't do that, but it rejected almost every other claim in, in the lawsuit. So I think that's an important thing to put here as well. So there's going to be litigation, I suspect, around those issues that um, went in CDCR's favor as well. So the, yeah. um, you know, there's lots of, lots more briefs will be filed. There has been a cross appeal. So all of those issues are going to be before the third district court of appeal. Right. Stay yeah. tuned. <laughs> what, 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 this is what I, I think I propose that we do as a committee. Uh, well, we can, I guess, suppose we can vote on it at the end of today's meeting, but, um, that we just continue to look at it and we help develop legislation to try to to try to address this issue. Um, I hope that the third district uh, ends up ruling in our favor, but I agree with Ms. Schaefer that it will take over a year easily for that to get to get it resolved, and then it could go up to the Supreme Court, in which case it'll multiple years after that. So um, let's try to get it resolved. Great. Um, Thank you. Really thank you so thank you so much to you and your team, really, truly. Thank you. Um